Today, we're going to begin a, a new four-part series called Into the Unknown. It sounds really dramatic, doesn't it? Into the Unknown. And I think the subtitle really says it all. The subtitle is Four Decisions for Experiencing and Influencing Deep Change. Four Decisions for Experiencing and Influencing Deep Change. Now, if you're not a Christian, because you've realized just how hip- hypocritical churchgoers can be. Maybe you had a dad who cleaned up real nice for church, but didn't really bring that niceness home with you growing up. And so you saw the hypocriticalness there. Or maybe you have a mom or sister who's good at, at posting um, spiritual things online or showing, you know, like how perfect her life is on social media. But you know what a wreck her life really is because of some bad relationship decisions that she's made. It, whatever the reason is... Um, Well, whatever the reason is, let me just say this. This is one of those series where you get to be a little bit judgmental of Christians. In fact, you get to hold us accountable to what we say is important, but don't often or always follow through with. Because following Jesus comes from this inner realization, right? It comes from this inner realization that change is essential, that growth is essential, that transformation is essential. It's such a part of our life. It's, if you're a Jesus follower, you know uh, that before Jesus, you were headed in a direction um, that you didn't want to end up in. And the direction you were headed in didn't have a destination you wanted to end up in. So you know that change is essential, right? And as Christians, we're called to not just only transform and change ourselves, we're called to influence the world. But the, the sad reality is this, is that we're not often... Um, I shouldn't say often. We're not always very good at influencing the world. We're not often very good at changing and transforming ourselves. The Apostle Paul wrote in a letter uh, to the church in Rome, um, and he addressed this uh, idea of how influencing the world is often challenging, but changing yourself is, is often challenging as well. Um, and do you know what a life verse is? Do you know what a life verse is? I didn't really know what a life verse was until college. I had some friends share with me what a life verse is. Basically, a life verse is a Bible verse that is, it kind of sums up your whole life, right? It just kind of sums up your whole life. And I had several friends, you know, it's important to them. They got tattoos like in Greek or Hebrew because they wanted to keep it, you know, right in front of them. And as I thought about it, I was really just kind of embarrassed <laughs> because of what, what Paul addresses to this church in Rome, it was really what sums up my whole life, and maybe you can relate. This is what Paul says. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. (laughs) Have you ever felt that way before? And sadly, I think this probably sums up my life probably than any other verse in the Bible, because I find myself so often saying, why am I doing the things that I hate? Why am I not doing more of the things that I want to do? Have you ever felt that? You know, it's that, that, that getting stuck, that, that feeling stuck in, in a sin maybe. You get stuck in just a rut of, of doing things you don't feel. I'm not progressing. I'm not moving forward. And, and so I asked this question, which I think can be an enlightening question. Um, the question is, why is changing so challenging? Why is growing so challenging at times? Why do we get stuck? And I think there's a couple different reasons as we think through this. Um, one of them... Uh, comes uh, from this idea in, in a book called Switch. Are you familiar with Switch? It's written by Chip and Dan Heath. Um, Chip and Dan Heath are, are brothers. They're researchers. One of them is a, a business professor at Stanford University. And they, they've written several good books. They're both believers. And they've written um, several books about change. And they say what, what often looks like laziness with change uh, is something different. Because change requires so much mental energy, doesn't it? It requires so much mental capacity. And and they said this, they said, what looks like laziness is often just exhaustion. Ever felt that? You're like, you want to change, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's just so exhausting, you know, and and life is just so exhausting, it's so draining. Why is change so challenging? Is because we're often just too tired, you know? We're often just too tired to change. Another reason is, is that we're often just too content, right? And I've felt this before. You know, you're just kind of too content with the progress you've made. You've made a lot of progress in your life, and, you know, that's, that's really good, but you're like, you know, I could keep growing, but it's so hard. Like, I'm really just, I'm really just kind of good enough, right? And, and you can recognize the, the, the fallacy of that right away. But sometimes, change, we're just too tired, we're too content. 
But there's another reason. Um, and this one, um, this one I think you can probably relate to as well, or you've been able to see in others. Hopefully you've been able to see this in yourself. Um, and this idea, um, I think, is really well um, portrayed in a movie. Um, now, if you're, if you're over the age of 45, or you don't have young children or grandchildren, especially granddaughters who want to be princesses when they grow up, uh, you might not have seen this movie. It's Frozen 2. It came out last year. Uh, and in this, one of the characters is experiencing a calling. It's Queen Elsa, okay? Queen Elsa is experiencing this calling from outside of her, calling her forward, calling her to leave and, and move on in the journey. And, and she experiences this. as She's trying to block out this call. And this is what she says. And I think she captures the tension so well with change. She says, everyone that I've ever loved is here within these walls. I'm sorry, secret siren, but I'm blocking out your calls. I've had my adventure. I don't need something new. I'm afraid of what I'm risking if I follow you. That's the thing with change. We often don't resist change. We resist the loss that could come with change. Really, it's too risky. Sometimes change is too risky because you know what you stand to lose but you don't know what you stand to gain, you know? And, and when you don't know what you stand to gain, and you know what you could stand to lose, it, it doesn't seem like it's worth it. Here's really the problem with change and with growing and moving forward along the journey, is that what we hold often holds us back. What we hold often holds us back. But figuratively, it, it holds us. It has a hold on you. Maybe you have a sin in your life that has a hold on you. And it often quite literally, holds us back from moving forward. Well, the good news for Christians is that when it comes to experiencing and influencing deep change, uh, the story of Abraham uh, should be an encouragement to us. It should be a challenge. It should be an inspiration to us. Um, Abraham is one of, if not the most influential people who's ever lived. And get this statistic. It's very fascinating. Over half of the nearly 8 billion people in the world today are either biological or spiritual descendants of Abraham. Christians, Muslims, and Jews, over half of the population of the planet today is either a biological or spiritual descendant of Abraham. It's amazing. And if you're a Christian, you know that you have been grafted in like a wild olive shoot into the tree of Abraham, the family tree of Abraham. So this should be really important and his story should be very important. So over these next couple weeks as we talk about these four decisions for experiencing and influencing deep change. I want to encourage you to read along in Genesis 12 through 25, okay? Over the next few weeks, I want you to read through Genesis 12 through 25. If you haven't in a while, uh, you'll find that some of these stories in Abraham's life are very, very strange. Very strange stories, in fact. Um, and I hope that you'll connect with them because they mirror often the journey of the Christian life and the journey that Jesus calls us in as well. And it begins with a promise, right? Abraham's story begins with a promise. And this is what God says to him. He says, I will make you, Abraham, into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now think about this. This was something that was written over 3,500 years ago, and look at how it's played out today. It was written, it was documented over 3,500 years ago, and look at how it's played out today. Over half of the world is a biological or spiritual descendant of Abraham. People on earth are being blessed through his story. But this promise did not come without a cost. This promise did not come without a cost because right before God gave him this promise, this is what he said to Abraham. He says, go forth from your country, Abraham. Go forth from your people and from your father's household to the land that I will show you. Go forth. Leave three things that mean the most to you, your country, your culture, what you've grown up with. Leave your people, your friends, you know, the, the people who have shaped you along the way in your father's house where you have drawn your identity, your safety from. Leave all of the things that make up who you are, Abraham. 
and go forth to a land that I will show you. There's an important question here that I think is, is important for understanding Abraham's story. It's important for us to understand how that works in our own lives as well. And it's this. Could God not have blessed Abraham where he was? It's kind of an absurd question, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about the, the almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth. Could God not have blessed him where he, where he was? He's calling him to a new land, right? He's calling him to a new land. And that land is supposedly well-resourced and it has lots of resources. I mean, could God not have brought those resources to where Abraham was? You know, why did Abraham have to leave? It's an important question. Why did Abraham have to leave? Now, I really enjoy, something you'll learn about me, I really enjoy um, the nuances in Scripture, uh, maybe a word or a phrase here and there, that uh, when you understand its original context, it illuminates the rest of the passage and it illuminates the rest of the story. And in Abraham's case, um, in, in the beginning of his call with God, or his call from God, um, just about everything that follows that is commentary on his life or his family's life all the way up until Jesus, right? So it's important that we understand it and it's important that we have a full picture of what's going on. Now, I hesitate to do this because sometimes when you drill down into a word or a phrase that, you know, um, maybe it's in a different language and maybe you're trying to go back and set it in its original context, it might give you the feeling that when you read the Bible, you're not getting the whole story, which is not the case. But the beauty of drilling down into a word or to a phrase is that it illuminates the rest. And so we're going to do that here. I, I want to drill down into, as we try to answer this question, could God not have blessed Abraham where he was? Why did Abraham have to leave? Into this little phrase. Go forth. Go forth, Abraham. My Jewish friends have told me that properly translated... Go forth is lek leka. Can you say lek leka? Lek leka. Lek leka. Lek leka is intentionally ambiguous. There's multiple interpretations of it. It's a fascinating um, couple set of words here. Lek leka means go forth. And yet through the centuries, uh, different rabbis, different teachers, different scholars, even Christian scholars, have interpreted, interpreted this in different ways. And I want to share a couple of them with you today, a couple of these interpretations, because each one contains a different side of the invitation of God's calling in Abraham's life and the calling of our life as well. Go forth, lek leka, can be interpreted as go for yourself. Go for yourself. Travel for your own benefit and good. It, it, the journey itself is this personal transformation. Go for yourself. There I will make you into a great nation. Here you'll not have the merit of having children. Go forth, Abraham. Go for yourself. Abraham was about to leave everything that meant something to him. His land, his friends, his family. Go forth. He's about to leave that. And right from the beginning, we understand what God is trying to teach is that what seems like a sacrifice in the beginning, in the long run, is not so. Abraham was about to transition from the familiar to the unfamiliar. A transition into the unknown. And that transition, that leap of faith, requires trust. Trust, in Abraham's case, not in a visible power which his children came to see in his visible power of God, but an invisible voice. Go for yourself. Trust in me. Now, we see along in that journey that Abraham grows, as we'll see over these next couple of weeks. That Abraham grows and he develops and he, he changes. And we understand that the journey itself was changing him. Just like the journey that God calls us into. The Apostle Paul addresses this really well. He says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do, if only we would go forth. Go forth. Go for yourself. Believe in what you can become. Another interpretation of lek leka, of go forth, is go by yourself. Go by yourself. That the journey is often a lonely journey, isn't it? 
When the rest of the world is going one way, you are going another. And it's in this understanding of the interpretation that we begin to develop that sense of reliance on God, that sense of solidness, that sense of understanding that only He has the words of life. Go by yourself. Like the old song that we used to sing often, though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Another interpretation is to go with yourself. This one's a little bit different because this one is actually, along the journey, you're going to learn these values and principles and truths. And I want you to take them with you to where you go, to spread them throughout my world. There, there's a rabbinic teaching, um, it's called a midrash, um, that highlights this well. It says this, it says, When the Holy One said to Abraham, leave your land, your birthplace, and your father's house, what did Abraham resemble? A jar of scent with a tight-fitting lid, put away in a corner so that its fragrance could not go forth. As soon as it was moved from that place and opened, its fragrance began to spread. So the Holy One said to Abraham, Abraham, many good deeds are in you. Travel about from place to place to place so that the greatness of your name will go forth in my world. And we, of course, Christians, are to be the aroma of Christ, not to be in a corner, but to go out, to move about the world so that the beauty and the attractiveness of Jesus can go forward. Go with yourself. A fourth interpretation of go forth is to go to yourself. Now this one's a little bit more of a, a mystical understanding of God's calling. Abraham to leave behind his land, his people, his family. To strip all of that away. And, and what do you have left? And, and so often that's what we do is, is our lives are, are made up of so many different you know, things, so many different worldviews, so many different you know, people and, and church and, and, and family. And, and yet when you strip all of that away, what, what is left? And it's the journey that reminds us to go to yourself, to know who you really are. When you strip all the, that away, that you are one who is loved by God. The journey itself is the slow alignment of your will to God's will, the way that it was in the beginning. Go for yourself, go by yourself, go with yourself, go to yourself. And, and so we ask this question, could God not have blessed Abraham where he was, but with an understanding, a broader understanding of what God was really calling him into? The question is really, could he have received it? Could he have received the blessing that God had in store for him? More than that, could he have become the blessing that the world needed? So, Abraham went as the Lord told him. And thankfully, because we would not be here today if he had not. Abraham answered this call and he learned this. And this is so important. And this is a foundational principle of our faith. One that God wanted us to understand from the beginning of his calling in Abraham's life and in our own. That when following God, the best is always yet to come. The best is always yet to come with God. And this can be so easy to lose sight of, can it? The best is coming. The best is coming. When following God, the best is always yet to come. And so today, I want to give you the first decision for experiencing and influencing Deep change, lasting change. It's choosing to remain open-handed. This is the first decision for experiencing growth in your own life, to experiencing growth in your family's life, to influencing the world to remain open-handed. Or another way of saying it is, you will only grow if you're willing to let go. Now, I would imagine that for those of you who've sat in church before, you have probably heard someone talk about the value of remaining open-handed. We know the value in our own life as we feel things in our lives that we try to hold on to that sometimes seem like they're slipping through our fingers, but so often when we hold them, they keep us from moving forward because what we hold often holds us back. So I want to invite you to take a next step in this. 
I want to invite you to do three things. The first is ask this question, not one time, but continually. Am I holding anything that is holding me back? Am I holding anything that's holding me back? Is there, is there a sin in your life that you've just kind of been holding on to for a little bit too long? Am I holding anything that's holding me back? Do you find yourself responding, uh, overreacting to things at times that you, later you step back and go, that wasn't that big of a deal. Why am I always reacting this way? What am I holding on to? Am I holding anything that's holding me back? The second thing I want to ask you to do is pray. Lord, help me to release my grip. Am I holding anything that's holding me back? Lord, reveal that in my life. Help me to release my grip. Lord, what, what am I holding on to? Reveal it to me because sometimes we just don't see it. Lord, help me to release my grip. And then I want to ask you to do a third thing. I want to ask you to practice remaining open-handed. Now, what I'm about to ask you to do is maybe a little bit different than um, what, what we often talk about when we talk about giving. Okay? You often hear, and you should, that we need to be generous. And this is a generous church. In fact, that was one of the things that drew us to us. This is such a generous church. One thing that we heard all along the way is that this church, whenever they hear a need, they meet that need. You are a giving church. So that's not what I'm talking about. I want to ask you to consider giving away something that you love. To give away something that you love. Not to meet a need in someone else's life, but to meet a need in your own life. Because what we hold often holds us back, doesn't it? What we hold often holds us back. And sometimes it's, not, it's something small. I want to ask you to give something away so that you can prepare for the times in your life where life weighs you down and it's so hard to hold on to something. I want you to be a person that gives away something that you love, to practice in advance before that time comes, to give away something that you love. And you're saying, well, how is that so important? Because when that moment in your life comes where you're called to take a next step, to call into that, into that unknown space from the familiar to the unfamiliar, that you have already practiced remaining open-handed. Maybe it's an heirloom. Maybe it's something that's really important to you. Practice remaining open-handed. Give away something that you love. Now, we're at the beginning of this series, and I wanted to introduce the concept of Abraham and the call so that you can reconnect with it. I hope that you'll read Genesis 12 through 25 as we move forward in these next couple weeks, and we look at these four decisions for experiencing and influencing deep change in the world. The first is remaining open-handed. Am I holding anything that's holding me back? Lord, help me release my grip. And maybe if you have the courage, you practice it this week by finding something that you love and saying, I, I want to be someone who remains open-handed. Lord, help me to practice that this week. Let's pray. Father, I I'm so grateful for the stories in your word which help us understand you and help us understand our role in light of who you are. The story of Abraham is certainly that, Lord, and I'm, I'm so grateful for his courage to follow you, even when he knew so little about you. And I pray that we will have the trust, the courage to do the same. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.